Hey there! Just want to update you on some uh, announcements here at Honey Creek New Province Friends Church. Uh, the whole world isn't shut down, and nor are we, so we want to just uh, update you about a few things. Uh, just want to remind you that the Monday morning uh, soda fountain breakfast is on uh, from uh, 6.30 to 9.30 on Mondays at the Soda Fountain in downtown uh, New Providence, Iowa. Uh, House of Compassion will be feeding uh, people who are um, food uh, challenged at uh, 5 o'clock there in Marshalltown on Church Street. And uh, Val Cook is the leader of that. If you'd like to be a part of that, just get a hold of her. And we want to let you know that there will be a Christmas Eve virtual service uh, that's going to be premiering at 6 p.m. on Christmas Eve. K.D. Burkett will be filming and putting that collage of music and readings together. And we're looking forward to that. That'll be real creative and a lot of fun as we celebrate uh, the coming and the meaning of Christ coming to us. Also, I want to praise uh, Honey Creek New Providence. You guys, you guys are beautiful. As the food pantry basket that's out in the foyer continues to fill up repeatedly as we supply the Eldora Food Bank. Uh, so please continue to do that um, and uh, just leave your donation there in the basket. And Terry Bear is uh, uh, head of our missions. He's been taking it to the pantry. And also this week we have a couple of birthdays. Les Clampett uh, is on the 14th. His birthday is December 14th. And Caitlin Tool is December 19th of this week. So let's send out some cards to them. Also just a reminder to you... Uh, out of respect and out of precautions with the COVID-19, uh, I'm not going to be making any uninvited uh, visitations to people in the church. Uh, that's in your uh, ballpark, on your side of the court. If you want me to come visit you, I'd be glad to visit you. I'd love to visit with you. But I want to leave that up to you uh, because of just all the different health issues going on uh, in our county and in our state and in our country and the world right now. So, love to visit with you if you'd like to. And uh, I think that's about it. No, And there will be no Bible study until January either. And hopefully the curve will drop and we'll get back to some sense of normalcy in January. But I'm going to say this uh, as a caution. That may not happen. <laughs> uh, so just, uh, this is a long speed bump. Uh, we're going to get through this, but it still may be a while before things turn back to kind of normalcy uh, for the church and for our community. So I want you to be well, and I want you to stay well. And uh, remember those that are uh, besieged in their homes, in their uh, long care term facility rooms. Uh, I do want to tell you that I saw Martha Eckhart yesterday. And I saw Mid-March today through the glass and spoke to them both on their phones. And um, they're doing remarkably well for the situation. And also, uh, just remember those who are uh, ill. And we want to remember Val Cook and her family as Val's father, Virgil Heatland, passed away uh, a few days ago. So hold them in your prayers, too. And uh, just know that we're going to get through this together. And that God is in our midst. For wherever two or three are gathered in His name, He is with us. Peace to you. Lord bless you. Oh soul, are you weary light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in His wonderful faith, and the things of earth will grow of His glory and grace Through 
death into life everlasting He passed and we follow him there O'er us and no more have dominion For more than conquerors we are Turn your eyes upon Jesus Look full in his wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strange Turn your eyes upon Jesus Look full in His wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strangely dim In the light of His glory and grace Good morning, and I just want to uh, thank KD Burkett for being behind the camera and filming today as we get ready for this coming Sunday. Today's texts uh, are from Isaiah 61, 1 through 6, and verse 10. And then also uh, another text is Psalm 98, which I would have chosen for the call to worship. Because in the 98th Psalm, the, uh, the psalmist calls for the whole earth to be full of joy because he comes the Lord is coming to set things right and for we believers uh, those things have been set into motion already by the coming of the Christ and so I'd like to begin with joy to the world the Lord is come let earth receive her King let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing and heaven and nature sing and heaven and heaven and nature sing Isaiah 61 1 through 6 the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me. We're going to recognize these words because Jesus quotes this text at Nazareth. Uh, his uh, his uh, Magna Carta, if you will. His uh, overarching uh, understanding of His vocation as Messiah. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, to release the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of the righteous, a planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities they have, that have been devastated for generations. Aliens will shepherd your flocks, foreigners will work your fields and vineyards, and you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. For He's clothed me with garments of salvation. He's wrapped me up in salvation, literally in Hebrew, and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, as a bride adorns herself with jewels, for as a soil makes the sprout come up and a garden grow causes seeds to grow so the sovereign lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all the nations i want to focus today on joy 
We read in the third verse, He will stow on them a crown of beauty and instead of ashes and the oil of gladness. The oil of gladness, which is a symbol of joy, which is also mentioned in the 23rd Psalm, verse 5. You anoint my head with oil. Oil as a symbol of abundance and God's joy, the joy of God. And a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. So, this morning I want to talk about God, the joy maker. There came into our studio a young blind woman. She was guided by a beautiful seeing eye dog. As I talked with her, I discovered that she had rare inner sight. She asked me if I knew how to spell the word joy. The ability to correctly spell joy, she said, stood in her good steed for many years. Naturally, I asked her how she spelled the word. This is what she said. Not many people know how to spell joy because they get their lives all mixed up. You must spell joy as Jesus did with his whole life. By this time, I was listening intently. She said that so many people get joy mixed up with happiness. If I had my natural sight, it might make me happy, she said. But it would not guarantee I would have joy. Happiness comes from what happens. Joy endures regardless of what happens. Happiness may come from a temporary stroke of good fortune, like a raise in salary or appreciation from other people. Joy is what we have in our hearts when the world has done its worst to us. It comes from the approval of God's Spirit in our consciousness when we have stood up against popular silliness or fought some, off some deeply entrenched wrong or injustice. Happiness may turn on the rise or fall of a thermometer as is in one of Dickinson's characters, who would not enjoy anything when the wind came from the northeast. We would be happy if a loved one recovered from an illness, the return of ships laden with treasure, or the approval of our friends, she said. Joy is as lasting as the last breath upon Calvary's cross. It has eternal quality. It is one of those things set forth to his disciples by Jesus, who said, Receive my joy. As one person wrote, Joy is the serious business of heaven. I like that. Joy is the serious business of heaven. And in the fruit of the Spirit, mentioned in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and the rest. Joy is something that we long for, but often seems difficult to grab. Maybe because it is a gift and not a commodity to purchase. Joy is a fruit, a symptom, if you will, of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us richly produced by God's work in us, and it is part of God's will for us that we be filled with joy. Today's text from Isaiah recalls God's great reversal of circumstances for His exiled people. The imprisoned are to be set free, the broken healed, the captives released, and moreover, Zion, Jerusalem is being rebuilt after its destruction. And the nations will see the power of God unleashed on His people's restoration. And God's people will rejoice, and they will well garland, and their joy will be like that of a wedding feast. Beautiful images, trying to capture the spirit of joy. We know that even the most mature of God's people experience periods of distress and joylessness. Job wished he had never been born. David prayed to be taken away to a place where he would no longer have to deal with reality. Elijah, after defeating 450 prophets of Baal with fire called down from heaven, fled into the desert and asked God to take his life. 
If these men struggled, how can we experience consistent joy in our Christian life? Well, let's just talk about joy for a moment. The first thing is to realize is that joy is a gift. We receive it. The root word for joy is in the Greek kara, which is closely related to the Greek charis, for grace. Joy is both a gift of God as well as a response to the gifts from God. Joy comes when we're aware of God's grace and relish His favor. In the New Testament, we find expressed realities of the earliest Christians beyond experiencing a transcendent power in the resurrected Jesus, they also demonstrated free speech and boldness to proclaim the good news. They found new hope and joy in Christ. They, they experienced a different kind of peace and also joy. One of the reasons the early believers found joy is that they found themselves in a genuine, caring community. The early Christians had a common hope and a common burden. Paul wrote of this community in Philippians, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. It is self-evident that one way to experience joy is to focus, of course, upon God, rather than just dwelling on our difficulties of those things that rob us or want to rob us of our contentment. Rather, we can dwell on the beauty and the grace of God found in the face of Christ. This is not to say we should deny our discontent or stuff our negative emotions. Following the example of many of the psalmists, we can pour out our hearts to God as we lament, as we complain, as we ask for God's help. We can tell Him bluntly all the things that trouble us. But when we submit those things to Him, remembering His loyalty to us found in Jesus, the gift of joy swells up within. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, all my inmost being, praise His name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgives all our sins and heals all our diseases. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His love for those who revere Him as far as the east is from the west. When we talk as Christians about the topic of joy, like the woman that I started out with in this sermon, it is easy to get confused that it's a mere feeling of happiness. But feelings are fleeting and depend on the circumstances of the moment. In fact, happiness is based on the English word happenings, things, events that happen. Christian joy is different. I've almost, almost always have likened joy to uh, the ocean. On the surface of the ocean, we have waves up and down that symbolize happiness. Determined by wind, determined by the pole of the moon, waves happiness. But underneath the waves, down deep in the ocean, are these strong ocean currents. They are not deflected. They are not, they don't veer. They don't waver. They're steady. And so Christian joy is this steadiness, this bedrock underneath the happenings in our lives, the waves that go up and down. We go up on the crest of the wave and then we drop down in the swell. Joy is deeper than that. It is the bedrock of the Christian's soul. It's not found in circumstances, but on the certainty that we are loved by the divine, poured out gratuitously on the cross for us, put on display for the entire world to see. While incarcerated for his faith in Christ, Paul wrote to the believers in Philippi, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. The Lord is near. And so, one of the things we, that I've been thinking about is what steals my joy? What tries to take my joy away, this, this deep current? Well, one of the things is my self-doubt. 
about who I am. Realizing the depth of my brokenness, uh, looking back into my past, looking into my heart, and seeing all the fickleness, all the messiness that rumbles within me at times. And so I can begin to doubt the goodness of God. And my joy slips away. What else can steal our joy? Toxic thieves. People attempt to steal our joy. They're cave people. Citizens against virtually everything. You know the kind. They're energy vampires. They're joy stealers. And so we want to move ourselves away from those people. If they drag our spirits down, then we need to move away and keep our spirits enlivened and full of God's joy. Another thing that takes joy is when I take myself too seriously. We need to be lighthearted about what occurs in our lives. To look at our lives in a very humble way. Because in the end, joy is a cheerful revolt against self and pride. It's to realize where I am in the universe compared to the goodness and greatness of God and my little time here on earth to serve and follow Him. The other way that we can uh, sustain our joy is to, of course, fixate on Christ. We live in a culture that is obsessed with lots of things. We get fixated on things, on people, on our favorite sports team. But a way of losing our joy is by losing our focus on Christ. Our point on the horizon has to be Christ Himself, Christ alone. We are always, as the book of Hebrews says, we are always to be fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. So stay away from those thoughts of self-doubt, self-incrimination, inner child abuse, if you will. Distance yourselves from those who are toxic, who want to steal your joy. Don't take yourself too seriously, but live in the um, mystery of life, that we even have breath, that we have the capacity to think. We have the capacity to connect with God, with each other, with nature. Fixate on Jesus. The other thing that can steal our joy is when I want to control things that are BYOC, beyond my control, actually BYMC, beyond my control. I think of the time and the energy I have wasted on trying to control people, control situations, control institutions or gatherings I'm a part of. I like what Tony Campolo said years ago, control is an illusion, and he is correct. So let's not waste our spiritual energy in an attempt to control or manipulate situations, people, families, churches, organizations. Rather, let's focus on how we can put ourselves before God in a way that He can continually reshape us and reform us and remind us, Romans 12, 1 and 2, to understand ourselves more deeply and fully so that Christ can heal those broken places in us so that we become more and more like Jesus. And so in that way, in the end, as Stephen Covey talks about in the seven habits of highly effective people. It's the people who work on themselves that have the capacity to be bigger influencers of others because they've done this hard inner work. And that's the call of the Christian, to be conformed in the image of Jesus, the Son of God. Another way that we can boost our joy and kind of keep our joy fervent and alive is to commune with the saints. 
The book of Hebrews informs us that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. This is a great, great metaphor that, that the writer of Hebrews uses. It's like being in a uh, amphitheater where the chariot races and the games were played in the ancient Roman world. That the saints are cheering us on from the bleachers. And the primary way that they do that is through reading their writings about their journeys with God. That's one of the ways we can stay connected to God's joy is by communing with those who have gone on to glory through their writings. You cannot help but be inspired by the struggles of St. Augustine through his book, The Confessions, or St. Francis's The Little Flowers, or Thomas A. Thomas Akempis's The Imitation of Christ that was written during the bubonic plague in Europe. And here we are in the midst of a pandemic, a good time to pick up the imitation of Christ again. Reading the saints strengthens our spirits, generating Holy Spirit joy. Because often what I have discovered is, oh gosh, this person has struggled 1,800 years ago or 1,400 years ago with the very same things I struggle with, yet they were a giant. At least we would say they were giants. And we find this connection. We connect with their brokenness and realize that God used them in mighty ways and that God is using us in mighty ways often though we're blind to it, which is also a gift. Joy is, to be, is meant to be the hallmark of the Christian life. Like I mentioned earlier, it's the second mentioned f fruit in the basket of fruit that is given by the Holy Spirit. And we receive this gift when we focus on the truth of God, communing with Him through prayer, and relying on the community of believers God has graciously provided. The book of James, which is probably the earliest of the Christian writings, begins with a connection between, of all things, suffering and joy. As the fledgling Jesus movement was being pounded by misinformed and uh, angry opponents, James writes these words, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And so those two, suffering and joy, go back together in a way that uh, sounds paradoxical, but is actually the true path to joy. Of course, the, well, the primary way for us to find joy, to tap into the divine joy that Jesus offers, is by earnestly listening to the Spirit of God through prayer, through scripture reading, through meditation, And when I talk about prayer, I'm not talking about living in a spirit of denial of trouble, but that we offer our struggles to God. A God who's found hanging on a cross. A God on a cross saturated with joy, which allowed Him to endure the crucifixion. You see, Christian joy is not the absence of suffering, but the gift of God fully present in the midst of our suffering. The book of Hebrews proclaims, For the joy set before Him, Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame, and He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider Him who endured such opposition for sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Joy. 1 Peter has a powerful little section in the first chapter, verses 7 through 9. And these words are words, words written to us because it was written to Christians a few generations after Jesus who did not, of course, get to physically see Him, but spiritually felt Him 
and we're following him. He writes these words, and I want to leave this with you. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And so this Sunday, this Sunday in Advent, it's about the joy of God found in the person of Christ. I pray that His joy be made complete in you, fulfilled in you, that His joy would reach its destiny, its goal line in your heart as we follow the Christ. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of His righteousness and wonders of His love and wonders of His love and wonders, wonders of His love. May the joy of the Lord be your strength. Amen. So